Good morning, everybody. Um, this is our sixth global online biodiversity informatics seminar. Um, I'm very pleased that this morning we have Dr. Robert Anderson of the City College of New York um, with us to give a seminar. Uh, before I don't give a long introduction for Rob, I'll mention that our next seminar will be on the 25th of September, same time, same place. Uh, the speaker will be Sergio Estai, who is a uh, professor at the Universidad Austral de Chile in Valdivia. Uh, and Sergio works with uh, invasive species and especially uh, crop pests and their, their tendency to uh, become invasive. Um, so be sure to watch the seminar list um, and come back and join us in a month. For right now, um, Rob Anderson, again, is a professor, and I believe that is recently formalized as his true title. Congratulations, Rob. Um, a professor at City College of, of New York. Um, Rob actually did his PhD here at the University of Kansas decades ago uh, and was a, a pleasure to work with back then and um, has been um, a leader in this, this field of, of uh, understanding species distributions um, beginning in graduate school and ever since. Um, he was a co-author on a book that was published in 2011 on ecological niches and geographic distributions has also led or participated in many other um, publications in the field. So I'm not going to go any farther than that in terms of an introduction, and rather I'll just turn it over to Rob. Um, one last point, sorry Rob, not quite yet. One last point is um, I've posted the um, email for, for sending questions. It's the biodiv training at uh, gmail.com. So please do send questions. And if you're able to, send your questions before the end of the seminar. And that way, at the end of the seminar, I can pass your questions on to Rob. Um, OK, now with that, I'll pass the microphone to Rob. Am I on? You are on, Rob. It's all yours. OK, great. Uh, thank you so much, Town, uh, for the invitation to do this. It's really exciting. And I want to, uh, to really salute Town for what he has done over the years uh, to push the field forward and to pull others along with him, both conceptually and technologically. And I will now go ahead and share the desktop here. Let's see. OK, do you guys see um, a PowerPoint presentation? And I guess town? What we're seeing is your Windows Explorer right now. Sorry about that. Close that. Try back this. OK. All right, are we good now? Yes, we are. Go for it. OK, so I'm going to go full screen here. OK, wonderful to be here uh, with all of you all over the world. Uh, it's really exciting um, to be able to share with so many people simultaneously. And what I'd like to talk about today is putting things into the context that I see of how ecological niche modeling and related fields relate to the bigger area of biodiversity informatics. And basically, how can we harness information uh, regarding biodiversity for uh, various academic and applied uses. So I want to mention that you know, everything starts in the field. Our data come from the field. Um, and hopefully, it should return there as well as we validate our predictions uh, by more than just uh, internal validations of the data we already have. This is some of my work in Venezuela, um, in northwestern Venezuela, in a really fascinating area. So on the left, we have um, some of the fairly intact um, environments there. And then over on the right, we have 
you know, within 60 to 100 kilometers, uh, the second largest oil refinery uh, in the country, and an area recently deforested for a reservoir. And these represent the twin challenges or the twin uh, really drivers of change, uh, climate change and land use change that all biogeographers have to think about uh, in the modern era. And this talk is going to be framed uh, by two perspective pieces that I'm doing. Uh, my students don't think that's very um, academic, so they tell me I should call them thinking pieces. Um, the first, uh, I was asked to do a perspective uh, that was both relevant uh, or accessible uh, to non-specialists and uh, relevant to specialists. If anyone ever asks you to do that, run and hide. Um, but I tried to do this via a series of uh, boxes uh, with the basic ideas and then a whole series of footnotes uh, with technical details. I was also asked, to, actually for the same journal by a completely different group of people, to do a perspective on how we can make niche models better, especially with climate change uh, applications. So some of that uh, basic, you know, fundamental thinking of how things fit together is going to come into this talk as well. However, what I'm really going to show uh, is some empirical work on, that comes out of two NSF-funded projects. One on heteromyid rodents in South America with many collaborators. And the second that's ongoing, uh, small mammals in Madagascar, uh, again, uh, with many collaborators. And this is a sampling of people who were working in the first project. And uh, so my collaborators are diverse in almost every way possible. Um, almost all of my students speak at least, well, a language other than English with at least one of their parents. And um, we're very proud of the diversity of people involved uh, in our research. So I'm going to start with the framework of how I think things fit together, then consider issues of sampling bias, uh, move on to aspects of model tuning, uh, of evaluation, and looking at model complexity, go on to uh, a couple studies about the ecological reality of getting more realistic estimates of suitability and connectivity, and then five point towards some areas uh, still uh, needing progress. So most people who are not working directly in the field of biodiversity are very surprised about our lack of knowledge, even for groups like mammals, birds, and butterflies where we have relatively good knowledge and good field guides in many parts of the world. What we know about most species really is a very basic range map and some uh, natural history information that's summarized, right? Um, at the same time, new species are still being described all the time. Um, this book just, uh, talks about 100 of the most interesting new species in the last decade. And even last year, a new carnivore, uh, the Olinguito, was described. But at the same time as of this lack of uh, knowledge about individual species, we have had an explosion in the availability of biodiversity data, as all, you all know, primarily occurrence records, points in place, uh, points in space and time where a particular species has been observed. So the question is, what can we do uh, to harness this information, these presence-only records, which is what we have for most species on Earth, the vast majority of species on Earth. That's about all we know. And then at the same time, over the past decade, we've just had an explosion in the quality and quantity of environmental data that can be relevant for studying biodiversity, especially with more satellite-derived products uh, being made free. And then biodiversity informatics uh, has moved into this area, especially through distributed databases. And many of you have been involved in this. Uh, really, the pioneer, in my view, was Manus, which has now been taken over by VertNet. And all of these kinds of uh, data sets generally eventually feed into GBIF. Um, but the most important thing about the concept of a distributed database is the various museums or other providers maintain their own data and make it continually larger and better, um, but yet the user only makes a single query. Um, and that way, each time the user makes the query uh, into the future, it hopefully will be better and better information. So then what do we do with that? Um, most of the kinds of studies um, looking at distribution somehow are related to studying the niche. And one perspective is a mechanistic perspective uh, where there's process-based uh, studies of physiology, usually through lab or greenhouse experiments. That's, of course, very difficult. A very different approach to the same issues is correlative modeling, uh, which is via statistical associations, 
and these are usually variables that are somehow correlated with physiology, but based not on experiments, but from observations from nature. And this is the area uh, that I'm going to be talking about. And the question is, to what degree is this uh, useful as a first approximation? And then niche modeling, or as um, it's sometimes called species distribution modeling or bioclimatic modeling, has two kinds of input data, occurrence records and environmental data. Um, there are inputs into an algorithm, and there are many techniques and many algorithms available. But somehow they form a model of the species niche in environmental space, usually with um, abiotic environmental variables. This model then can be projected back to geography to identify the areas that are suitable for the species, all the pixels uh, that meet the species requirements. Also, this niche-based model can be projected to other places uh, or other time periods. So these kinds of models are used um, very commonly uh, for conservation applications, uh, for invasive species studies, for zoonotic diseases, which are diseases passed to humans from animals. And climate change is an overreaching issue that really affects all of these uh, kinds of applications. As Town mentioned, I was involved in a book project. Uh, he didn't mention that he led it, but I hope most of you already know this book. Uh, we, the authors uh, who suffered through the process um, and benefit tremendously from all the learning experiences along that process, really hope that it's a useful guide um, to, uh, to people and will further uh, research in many areas. One of the most uh, important ideas that uh, has been put forward in the field um, by others before this book, um, but is summarized in the book, is the idea that three major classes of factors have to be uh, appropriate for the species really to be present. Uh, abiotic conditions need to be suitable. Uh, the biotic context needs to be suitable. And movement or dispersal related factors uh, need to allow the presence of the species. Um, for example, uh, dispersal barriers uh, or local extinction uh, can Make, this, make it so that the species is not present. And I'm going to mention that I'm not usually going to go into uh, the details of mentioning the many studies that are appropriate uh, and important in each of the areas I'm going to talk about, um, because the, the studies that have most influenced me are cited in the papers. And so I'll make things go faster uh, by referring you to the papers themselves for the other literature. Another idea um, put forward. Um, by Jorge Soberon and that is important uh, in um, the book and I think important uh, for the field is the difference um, between two different perspectives on the niche. And one is the Eltonian perspective. And this is defined by linked variables. So variables that are modified by the presence of our focal species. Um, and this is the kind of dynamics, population dynamics, that are usually relevant at a fine scale and at a local extent. And these are density dependent processes um, that require pretty fancy math uh, to study, for example, resource impact vectors. A different, also necessary and complementary perspective is what can be termed the Grinnellian niche and is defined by different kinds of variables. These are unlinked variables, so the values of these variables are not modified uh, by the presence of our focal species that we're trying to model. And this is the kind of variable that Hutchinson termed sinopoetic, which is for setting the scene. And I think that's very appropriate. Generally, these are relevant at a coarser uh, grain and a larger geographic extent. These kinds of variables are relevant for density independent processes. Therefore, they can be modeled um, using somewhat simpler math, using um, or identifying sets of numbers, sets of multivariate space. And this is um, most of what I'm going to talk about and uh, the primary focus of the book that I mentioned. So well, almost a, well, over a decade ago, I began working um, with some computer scientists um, on a very interesting project. It was published in 2006. Probably most of you have used or heard of MaxEnd. And so this was um, really a fascinating time of working with people who had never before worked uh, with biologists, much less ecologists. And um, we, of course, presented the, um, the, the fundamental math of MaxEnd and how it can be applied to ecological modeling of species niches. Thank you. 
Many of you also know that uh, in addition to the success of Maxant, there's been a tremendous amount of controversy uh, recently, and much of that I think has to do with misconceptions and misunderstandings. So this program um, has uh, a GUI interface. Um, it's written in Java, so you can um, run batch files. And it's also been implemented in R packages. Many of the issues that have been brought up um, about Maxent um, have to do with conceptual misunderstandings about niches versus uh, distributions, potential suitable areas versus areas that are actually occupied. And this is really common to all ecological niche models. Another area is Maxent is very sensitive to biased input data. Um, so violation of some of the assumptions um, of the technique um, can affect the, um, the end result quite strong, strongly. But these are the same assumptions, again, um, that are common to all ENMs. So one of the questions uh, becomes, what can we do um, to either get better uh, input data or make our analyses less susceptible to uh, departures from the assumptions. There's also been controversy recently regarding the rescaling of the output, and this is a problem related to prevalence, and can prevalence be um, estimated with presence-only or present background data? Again, something that's not simply a maxent problem. Another thing is there are a lot of machine, machine learning terms or philosophies which are not um, something that we grew up in graduate school uh, learning about. And for example, regularization and clamping are jargon, but um, regularization is also a really important concept, and I'm going to go into that quite a bit. So what I'd like to do from now on out is talk about what has been for me Maxent Development Part 2 really looking at issues of bias, uh, complexity, and hopefully getting closer to ecological reality. And this has been through uh, those two NSF projects. And we've done fieldwork morphology and uh, DNA sequencing work. And then on the niche modeling side, began using the GUI interface, moving on to Java batch files, and then now into our scripts and our packages um, that we're developing. And what I'll do is show five studies led by five different students, shown at the bottom. So in the 2012 paper, I pointed out what to me were the five biggest pitfalls um, that we have to watch out for doing niche models. Three of them are data-related, uh, taxonomic uh, misidentifications, uh, the lack of databasing or inadequate uh, georeferences, um, and then the effects of sampling bias across geography, because biologists have not sampled the Earth evenly. The last two are more modeling related, um, which is uh, issues about selection of the study region and um, how to evaluate models so that we can identify optimal model complexity. Regarding the first two, um, obviously um, the best solution, perhaps um, eventually the only one is to, to get the right identifications, check the specimens, uh, check whatever other kinds of photographic or audio vouchers we have. And the world obviously needs a lot more revisionary taxonomy to understand what the species are and how we identify them. Regarding georeferencing, um, I'm certainly not the, the one to have come up with this vision, um, but the, um, the projects like Manus um, had standard ways to georeference that include a field that indicates possible error so that researchers can uh, filter out and discard sites with sites with low accuracy. But one of the most important things is having across the board georeferencing for entire collections of uh, various taxonomic groups. And that leads us to part of the solution for the third one. So when we, when we can quantify uh, sampling bias, or if we can quantify the uh, effects of sampling, um, we can correct for it. And that can be done um, by using records for an entire target group. So if we're interested in a particular species of rodent, if we have information about the other species of small rodents and the other species of small marsupials and shrews in the neotropics, um, we can use that information as an estimate of sampling effort, and then we can correct for it in our modeling. So taking care of Issue number two, um, when we have all of the good georeferences for a whole target group, can help us take care of pitfall number three. 
When we don't have uh, information for the full target group, um, there are approaches that have been proposed uh, by, to filter occurrence records either spatially or environmentally in order to reduce the effects of sampling bias. And so I was involved in a project led by Sara Barella, which is uh, online early in ecography. And I'll show you one uh, led by Robert Boria. So this leads us now to our second uh, issue, sampling bias. And a brief, brief introduction to Madagascar, of course, a uh, very large island off of Africa that has 100% mammalian endemism, um, but is 90% deforested. Um, here we're working with and taking advantage of a uh, tremendous series of collections by Steve Goodman. So in Rob's study, he was interested in um, actually quantifying whether, whether spatial filtering led to better models, because several uh, groups uh, around the world have done spatial filtering, um, but he couldn't find um, examples of actually does it make things better. So um, for this, he used Microgill Kawanai, which is the, probably the most commonly collected tenric uh, in Madagascar. And these are the occurrence records uh, put together uh, without any filtering. So 57 localities, but you see some clumps here uh, that don't look very natural. Uh, after applying a spatial filter of 10 kilometers, um, this, he had 31 localities. So you can see the same overall pattern uh, to the records, uh, but the clumps are not as strong. And so the idea is if we are reducing artifactual uh, clumping of localities, then we should have a better estimate of the species um, niche requirements uh, for our environmental variables as well. So what we want to do is avoid um, overfitting either to noise or to bias. Uh, in this case, uh, Tobias. Let me give a very brief example of efforts to, to balance complexity with generality. So two variables, not even in the context of a niche model. And you could fit a really tight relationship to, the, relationship to these, which really explains your training data well. However, when you apply that model to independently collected data, you know, it might not do such a good job um, explaining that second or that testing data set. So that the original model was overfit. And in this case, you know, a much simpler model uh, to the first series of data points would have had much better predictivity with the second one. And those are the general ideas that I'm going to be talking about uh, here and later in the talk. So what Rob did uh, was divide his records uh, spatially into three bins of approximately equal sample size. and he did this before and after uh, filtering. And it, he made a model with two uh, records from two of the bins with the background just from those bins and then projected it to, applied it to, or transferred it to uh, the third bin where he was able to evaluate the performance of the model in predicting those withheld data in a region uh, that wasn't involved at all in calibrating the model. He then switched things up, used uh, Two, uh, a different two of the, of the bins to make the model and evaluated it in the middle one. And then uh, the northern and middle bin to make the model and the southern one to evaluate performance. So it turns out that it, this technique, um, or the, the filtering, ended up having better uh, evaluation statistics both for emission rates and uh, for AUC, the area under the curve of the rock plot. Showing things here in geography, um, we see that the, the filtered model is a bit more general, not so tight uh, to some of the areas uh, with high um, concentrations of, of records. And if we zoom into the areas uh, with the red boxes in the north, uh, we see a really strong difference in the prediction. The top is the unfiltered and the bottom is the filtered. And all of these maps, the white areas are below a uh, threshold of the minimum training presence. And you see all the arrows in the top right indicate localities that were omitted from the model made with the unfiltered data set. So this, was, this model was made in the central and southern bins projected to the north and had a very high omission rate, whereas the same protocols with the filter data um, did a really nice job predicting those localities in the north. So now I'll move on um, to the third pitfall, selection of the study region. And a lot has been written about this uh, by quite a few authors. But at the bottom of, at the end of the day, we want to work in a study region where dispersal limitations and biotic interactions do not bias our environmental signal. Um, and for this, I would 
also lead you or you know invite you to look at the noise assumptions uh, from the framework paper dispersal demographic noise assumption, the biotic noise assumption, and the human noise assumption. And in there, you know, I cite uh, the various papers um, by various groups that have really developed the theory in this area. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go into it today, but our contribution uh, from my lab in this area was done by Lee Rasa a few years ago. And then the issue of model evaluation and model complexity. Um, so it was pointed out quite a while ago by other authors um, that we really need to evaluate with spatially independent data um, and with Maxent and also some other techniques, we need to merit very model complexity. So try various settings that lead to different levels of complexity. So here is our third part uh, of the talk, model tuning, evaluation, and complexity. And I'll give you an uh, introduction uh, to the study area where I've worked quite a bit. So this is northwestern South America. And then if we zoom into uh, northern Venezuela and northeastern Colombia, we see a fascinating series of mountain ranges that are separated by lowland depressions uh, where there's generally uh, very dry vegetation in the lowlands. If we zoom in even farther to a peripheral part of the study system, we have a peninsula called Paraguaná, which was an island during several interglacials and is now barely connected to the mainland by a spit of sand. On that uh, peninsula, there's a mountain about 800 meters tall called Cerro Santana. And on the mainland, we have the nearest uh, mountain range is the Serranía de San Luis. So we did quite a bit of field inventories in these places and, and we think examined all the museum specimens previously uh, collected uh, from from these areas by other workers. And compared with literature from other parts of Venezuela, we're able to characterize the overall fauna of small mammals. So these lowland depressions lead to a very strong pattern of nested distributions with um, lots of species and even entire genera dropping out at, at successive lowland depressions. This is some of our field uh, crews uh, at uh, Cerro Santana. We're in the lowlands at 200 meters. We have dry seraphitic vegetation of legumes and cactus, whereas at the top, uh, where that arrow is, uh, that's about 600 meters. We have dwarf cloud forest, um, a completely different environment, just you know, about an hour, hour and a half hike up the mountain. And as you would expect, uh, the larger uh, range, closer to the main body of the Andes, has a much larger uh, fauna. Uh, and the smaller mountain has only a, a few, in fact, four species of small non-volant mammals. The groups I'm going to talk about um, today are mouse opossums of the genus Marmosa, and then pocket mice of the genus Heteromys. So I mentioned um, that. Principles of the literature suggest that we should evaluate with spatially independent data and also vary model complexity. And then select your model uh, based on either performance uh, on withheld data or by information criteria. And so I'm going to talk about the first approach, although we're getting into the second as well. So the first study uh, is by Maria Sheglavidova, and this is for species with small sample sizes where she's uh, applying a jackknife approach um, for uh, jackknifing occurrence localities. And previously, this had been uh, implemented by others for model evaluation. And she's applying it in the context of tuning for model complexity, sometimes called tuning, sometimes called smoothing. Um, her species uh, that I'm going to talk about the most is actually found in Ecuador. And this is Heteromys teleus, um, which was uh, named a little bit over a decade ago, uh, known only from six sites at that point in an area of very high deforestation. And the question is, does climate explain the species' limited distribution? You know, how good can we do with only a very few records? And it's these species with very few records that we might actually have the most to gain by doing a niche model. We're uh, collaborating with Santiago Berneo and Ruben Harin in Ecuador who are and have been and are doing uh, field surveys uh, for the species. And this was the general range map uh, made by the IUCN Global Mammal Assessment uh, in 2006. And I was one of the mammalogists invited to work on this. And we worked on a whole lot of species um, of small mammals in over just a week. 
and we're doing our best to draw general range maps. And hopefully the next time something like this happens, big efforts, um, there can be a niche modeling approach that's viable. So we're comparing our niche modeling work uh, with a general range map for the species, which is you know the, the kind of the status quo of what's actually being used uh, by conservation um, analyses. So there are really two very, very important settings in MaxSent that you can change. And one is feature class. Feature class determines the flexibility of the modeled response. And there are various feature classes implemented, linear, quadratic, product, threshold, and hinge. And you can do various um, combinations of these. And these are the ones that are available for continuous variables. Another is the regularization multiplier. And this controls the strength of the penalty uh, for additional parameters and higher weights for those parameters. So regularization itself is a penalty in the model building process, a penalty for including an additional parameter. Now the regularization multiplier um, is not the same as beta, and this is a misunderstanding that many people have. The beta value is the regularization value that's specific to a particular feature class given your sample size. So uh, for every J feature class, there's a beta sub J value of regular, regularization. The regularization multiplier is a single coefficient that is multiplied to all of those individual betas. So you can control the strength of regularization across all of these feature classes in concert. So I'm going to have uh, two major Maxent misunderstandings that I want to address. And one is, if I give Maxent 19 variables, it will use them all and will be overfit. Now that may be true, but it's not necessarily true. In reality, regularization limits the number of variables and features that make it into the final model. And the stronger the regu regularization is, the fewer the variables and the fewer the number of features that will be in the final model. To determine that, you really need to look at the lambda file to see which particular parameters um, make it into the final model. So I'll go over the measures of performance um, that Maria used. And one is omission rate, the proportion of localities falling outside the prediction when it's converted uh, to a binary value by applying a threshold. And we want low values of omission rate. Another is the area under the curve of the rock plot. And this indicates the overall discriminatory ability uh, of the model across all signal strengths. And this is a rank-based, non-parametric measure. Now, there's a lot of instances where you want to be careful about AUC, and there's a lot been a lot written about AUC. Two things that I want to mention is that it's not comparable across species, and it's not uh, comparable uh, across different study regions, and this is certain, those two points are certainly true uh, for presence background uh, evaluations. Another point, however, is though within a single study region and for uh, the same species with the same set of, certainly with the same set of occurrence records, it is uh, a reasonable, uh, valid uh, statistic to use to compare different settings or different sets of environmental variables. And in these circumstances, we want a high value of uh, AUC. And we wanted, we wanted to use more than one single uh, metric um, to evaluate our models quantitatively. And I told Maria, you know, you can come up with a weighting scheme of these. And she thought that the weighting was very, um, would be very arbitrary. And so what she developed is a, the idea of sequential criteria. She said, look, Rob, she said, what well, all we really, really know is where the species is. So omission rate, which reflects uh, overfitting, should be our first criterion. And she then she said, OK, let's find the settings uh, that get give our best omission rate. And then of those settings, then let's look at AUC and see which one does better reg regarding uh, overall discriminatory ability. And there, there are other ways you could think of how to pick the best settings. Uh, but this is what she did. So here for this species, um, we have 
a series of feature class combinations that are indicated by different symbols. And then on the x-axis, we have a regularization multipliers from 0.5 up to 2. So she didn't go tremendously far on the regularization multiplier in this early study. Um, and then on the y-axis, we have the average omission rate. So the default settings uh, are in pink. And the settings here that showed the lowest omission rate are in this red box. So both of those then are candidates to move on to the next stage. The green is the one uh, actually chosen as optimal uh, in the end. So then we have the same graph, but for average evaluation AUC. So all of those jackknife iterations, uh, one of the records was left out. And this is the average uh, AUC over all of those uh, test AUC values. So top right, we see that the settings uh, that made it through the first pass. And we see that here they have very similar AUCs, but the one with the regularization of 2.0 um, was slightly better. And you see it had a little lower AUC than the, than the default settings, um, but, but not much lower. So let's look at the maps. We have the optimal on the left and the default on the right. And there certainly are differences. Um, we see that the optimal settings are not quite so clumped. The area of the highest prediction is not quite so clumped uh, in the center north. And also we'll see on the lower left that um, it's doing a better job picking up areas on some low coastal ranges um, where the species actually has been found. And that particular point uh, was not part of this analysis. And then we compare what, um, with what I and other specialists put together. And you know, definitely, I learned things from the niche models. And I think in addition to their uh, operational uh, quality and the finer grain, there, there's, there are also um, you know, rather different um, uh, advantages and different answers that we get from this. So after applying a threshold and then looking at deforestation and looking at protected areas, I think this is a very uh, helpful approach for species for which we don't know very much. Now, uh, moving on to large sample size. Alex Radosavlovic, uh, his paper was recently fe uh, featured on the Journal of Biogeography. So this is heteromyid rodents, which are related, uh, well, which include the fantastic kangaroo rats in desert environments. The tropical species in the genus Heteromys are found in uh, wet forests, uh, closed canopy forests, and usually evergreen forests. So traditional random subsets of training and testing localities um, are a, an overly easy test, and they cannot detect any overfitting to sampling bias. And they then thus overestimate evaluation statistics. So he implemented spatially independent evaluations. Here are four bins uh, of a pre approximately equal sample size, and four was just, um, were just chosen for convenience. Making a model on three bins, evaluating it on one leaving the second one out, using those for evaluation, the third and the fourth, and then averaging performance across the four. Here we have regularization multiplier uh, across the x-axis, and then the difference between calibration and evaluation AUC on the left, and this is a measure of overfitting. So we saw that that overfitting decreased dramatically uh, as we increased the regularization multiplier, and our best performance, we. We got that you know, by getting to RMs of maybe two to four. Basically, the same thing with omission rates, uh, where omission rates were very high at the, at the low values of regularization, and then dropped quickly um, to much better uh, and fairly, uh, fairly good levels of, uh, of omission. And then we look at the predictions in geography, and it's really striking. Uh, with really little protection against overfitting, you have uh, a very, very tight uh, overfit model. And then when you have uh, too strong a value, then it's you know, very diffuse and blurry. And our quantitative evaluation suggested that the best settings for this species with these variables in the study region uh, was an RM of about 2. And this corresponded fairly nicely uh, with what we knew about the species' uh, natural history from field notes. And we're going to get even farther into that in a minute. But this kind of uh, 
of evaluation scheme leads you to another problem um, that many of us have um, anyway, and that's the issue of non-analog environments. And this is a violation of what I termed the niche space assumption in the framework paper. So, and many other people uh, have pioneered this area. Um, and this is an area that um, that we are cognizant of, and we know it's important, but our group has certainly not been um, at the forefront of making these issues uh, known or, or clear. Um, but when you're making a model in part of your study region, and then evaluating it on another part of the study region where you haven't even taken background uh, data for calibration, you have the possibility of uh, truncated responses, response curves that uh, are truncated uh, in your calibration study region, and the need to project into uh, non-analog conditions. Um, so this is actual extrapolation, not only in, in, in geographic space, but extrapolation in environmental space in order to make your prediction. And as many other people have pointed out, this is risky. So a little bit of niche theory here. If we have two environmental variables, and we imagine the fundamental niche uh, for a species, if our study region includes all of those um, environmental combinations and a little bit more, then from a correlative perspective, we have a fighting chance of being able to identify uh, the species requirements. If, however, our study region for a background sampling doesn't even include all of the combinations that are suitable for the species, then the best we can hope for is identifying the subset of the fundamental niche which exists in our study region, uh, which is the existing fundamental niche is what it's been termed uh, in the Peterson book. But our estimate of the species uh, requirements is smaller than reality because it's truncated. Uh, our niche estimate is truncated by the fact that our study region doesn't include um, the species full fundamental niche. And it's easier when we think of this um, just one variable at a time. If we have a given abiotic variable, the blue bar shows the conditions of the calibration region, the green uh, vertical bar shows the point of truncation, and then the red area is non-analog conditions where we have to extrapolate in environmental space if we're going to make a prediction. And the, the question then becomes, well, how to extrapolate? And here are a couple options. One is continuing the response uh, just like it was at the truncation point. Another is to continue the modeled response um, without any constraints. And both of these are possible in MaxInt. They're possible in uh, regression-based techniques like AMS. Um, so these are just fundamental ways of how you might do that. It gets even trickier when your response is truncated at a point where it's still increasing. So is it realistic to think that the species response for suitability is going to go up and up and up? Well, probably not. When are you actually safe in extrapolation? Probably only when your response is truncated at a value of a very low suitability. So this leads us to maxent misunderstanding number two. Clamping tells me whether I had to extrapolate to make my prediction. Well, kind of yes, kind of no. In reality, clamping is simply a manner or a method of extrapolation in environmental space. It's one of the options of how to extrapolate if you have to do so. So if you really want to know whether there are non-analog conditions, um, whether you had to extrapolate, um, there are analyses like MESS um, that can tell you that. So multivariate environmental similarity surfaces. But I'll remind you that not necessarily all of the variables went into the final MaxInt model. So if there's non-analog conditions for some variable that you didn't even that you don't even get out of the final model, well then it's not it's not relevant for 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 the suitability values or for any issues of um, extrapolation or transfer. And I should also clarify that the clamping map that Maxent provides indicates the difference in model suitability between two options, between clamping and not clamping. So what is clamping? Clamping is the, the flat uh, dashed bar. 
um, to the right, where the response is the same as it was um, at the truncation point. So in this case, um, it may not be the most realistic way to do it. So you, if you uh, look at your response curves and you see that they're decreasing at the point of truncation, maybe you should turn uh, off clamping. The trick right now is that I don't think there's a way to turn or to, to turn off clamping uh, for some variables but not for others. Looking at a response curve that's increasing when truncated, well, which one is most uh, realistic? Well, clamping might be more realistic here than allowing the response to continue um, without restraint. Um, however, the farther you get uh, from the truncation point, you know, the probably the more unrealistic um, any kind of extrapolation is going to be. Overall, I mean, what I, I think is extrapolation is dangerous when your response curve is going down. It's more dangerous when your extrapolation or when your response is going up. And it's probably only safe in these areas where you've really gone through the whole uh, whole response curve, assuming, of course, univariate, uh, unimodal responses. All right, so our fourth area, which I think is fun because it's trying to get towards uh, higher ecological reality. So uh, Mariano is a PhD student of mine for one more week. He's defending a week from today. And this is his paper in Journal by Geography. So Mariano has been very interested in the fact that the world is not black and white, um, that there are gradients, and that environments are very patchy. So you see here a view from Cerro Santana looking down, and we see little gallery forests that have um, that along the ravines where there uh, are much uh, much higher, uh, taller trees and um, a very different microclimates. So these areas are suitable for forest dwelling species, and they're spatially marginal. So they're on the edge of the species local distribution, but they're not envi necessarily environmentally um, marginal. The problem, however, is our, um, our environmental variables that we use reflect the overall climate uh, for that region and probably not the specific conditions um, in those small areas that allow a forest species to be present. Another problem, excuse me, is um, we may not have the right kinds of environmental variables, excuse me, that really uh, show us what makes those sites um, suitable for the species. So when we're working with climatic uh, predictors at a coarse grain, these kinds of spatially marginal localities can be uh, problematic for the species. They can inflate our estimate of the species niche. So he worked um, with the same pocket mouse, Hermes anomalous, which is definitely known to be forest dwelling. But we have a lot of um, natural history information from collectors and a few papers to show that it's found in gallery forests in the Llanos of Colombia and Venezuela. Well, actually, we don't have records yet in the Colombian Llanos, uh, but certainly in Venezuela. Um, and these are savanna type environments. So what Mariano did was um, get some natural history guidance. He made a model using all localities, then ranked them, and assessed the environmental uh, information from field notes, and then made a new model without the marginal localities, without these localities in gallery forests or other uh, forests in a mosaic type environment. For example, at one place, um, it was found in these uh, yeah, Jano savannas in undulating tall grass savanna with scattered patches of upland forest and narrow bands of thin scrubby forest bordering streams. So we knew that about the general locality. He then dug deeper for that particular specimen and found out that it was found within a strip of sparse forest under a mud bank near a stream. And that um, kind of information uh, was very common in these types of mosaic environments. So this is the, the rank plot of suitability versus the rank of localities from the first model. And we'll zoom in to these localities in kind of the bottom half uh, in the red box. And he, these are the ones that he got um, the natural history information for from field notes. And lo and behold, all of the low suitability uh, localities were these mosaics. And when we had information, we really could tell that this spe the species was only found in the, uh, the gallery forest. There are very few of these mosaics um, above uh, 
above the rank of the lowest ranking extensive forest. So this was his uh, original model for the species with a, a minimum training presence threshold applied, um, so where you see white below that, and then green is uh, successively stronger uh, predictions. And the red localities are these mosaics. After removing mosaics, this is our second model. So really a very strong difference regarding extent. So if we were doing a conservation assessment here, this is one and this is two, the estimated uh, extent or distribution of the species would be very different. So what, um, what he is arguing, and I think makes a lot of sense, is our best understanding of the species using correlative models is to combine the outputs of these. So here we see our second model uh, shown over our first. So the green areas are areas that as long as there hasn't been deforestation, the species really has a very good um, environment. The orange areas are additional areas that could be suitable for the species, but only if the local conditions are special um, and promote the presence of forest in particular areas. So now I'll move on uh, to the fifth study, which was by a former uh, PhD student of mine, now a postdoc at the Smithsonian, Elisa Gutierrez, who's been working in the really exciting area of consideration of the effects of biotic interactions on species uh, distributions. And this has really been a boom the last couple of years, and I think that's uh, perhaps uh, one of the two areas that people are most excited about in the field. So these are mouse opossums. Um, and these are two sister species um, that he's looking at, um, Marmosa robinsoni in the blue records and Marmosa serophila in the brown triangles. And these have parapatric ranges. They come into contact, they abut, but they don't overlap. Very, very narrow uh, transition zones. If we zoom into that area I showed you uh, in the last slide, uh, with the box in the last slide, uh, we see in this area um, occurrence records for the two species, and again, they're not uh, not found sympatrically and um, not overlapping. What do the models say? Well, the model for Robinson eye is fairly extensive. Uh, the model for Serophila uh, is much uh, more restricted to even, uh, well, a subset of those conditions that's even uh, drier um, and a few areas uh, drier than, um, than, the, than those for Robinson eye. But then we overlap these, following actually some of the ideas of a study I did with Town a long time ago, and identified areas of potential sympatry. Those are areas that match the requirements for both species according to our niche models. So either of the species could be here. The question is which one is there, especially because we know that they, they aren't found together. So zoom in again, and then we're going to zoom into the peninsula itself, an area of really stark environmental contrasts. Basically, the whole peninsula is suitable for either species. But then if we look at the relative prediction strengths, we see which one is actually uh, more strongly predicted. And I will mention that under this little blue dot, there's uh, some pixels of green there. So let's look at this for each species. First for Serafa, looking at uh, all the areas where it was predicted. And then in the next slide, I'm going to remove the areas that were more strongly predicted for the other species. So that basically ends up removing um, pixels in a couple regions that are slightly higher and, um, and wetter. Let's do the same for a Robinson eye. Areas predicted for the species, and now areas where Robinson eye itself had the stronger prediction. So what we get here is we get, instead of a very broad prediction, we have very restricted prediction for Cerro Santa Ana in the south, and then some areas along the Fila de Montecano, which is a low ridge uh, in the north. So this species, what's really interesting here from a biogeographic perspective, is these populations that are known on the peninsula are separated from the mainland populations, not by intervening areas of unsuitable climate. Because the models say the climate is perfectly fine. Rather, they appear to be uh, allopatric from the populations of the same species on the mainland because intervening areas are suitable for the contener and actually more suitable for the contener than they are for Marmosa robinsoni itself. And so the idea that 
geographic isolation or allopatry can be maintained and perhaps even uh, caused at the beginning by abiotic interaction is, um, has very rarely uh, been put forward in the literature. And this paper just came out in ecography and uh, was featured on the cover, so we're very excited about that. And in where we've done our field work, it really, it really matches. Where Robbins and I is found in uh, the higher uh, parts of the, of the mountain and on down a little bit um, down these stream valleys. And so Rafala is really only found in the lowest areas. In contrast, Robbins and I, in other parts of its range, inhabits these really dry areas um, in regions where Serophila uh, doesn't exist at, in, in any habitats. So now I'll move on and um, point out some areas where we still have a lot of opportunity for progress and need for um, new research. So um, non-climatic abiotic variables. Biotic variables, like I mentioned, are a huge area. Uh, then quantifying uncertainty um, and coupling the outputs of niche models with dispersal demographic simulations. And these uh, last two are areas that other labs uh, have been leading and doing really exciting work and we look forward to moving in uh, to this area. And these are what are pointed out in the framework paper. So I mentioned we had been moving towards uh, more coding and there are two R packages that uh, my lab has been working on uh, with Matt Aiello at Stony Brook and Bob Muscarella at Columbia. And these um, were submitted to Software Notes and have received positive review. And we hope um, that these will be available. One is for spatial filtering, and the other is for spatially independent evaluations to be used in the uh, tuning exercise. Next frontiers, definitely biotic interactions. We're getting uh, more into this. And looking at the effects of genetic differentiation and local adaptation, integrating niche models with physiology and genetics. And these are projects in collaboration with Jessica Hellman and Brent Sinclair. And as I said, linking um, the niche model outputs um, to dispersal demographic simulations and to future climate change. At the very beginning, I mentioned that our data come from the field and should go back to the field. Um, so my most recent field work uh, was with Mariano in Costa Rica in the northwest on a really beautiful volcano. So this is our field crew going back to the field to test some of his preliminary predictions. And after you go back to the field, hopefully you also come back from the field. Uh, and this is a group uh, a little bit uh, more than a week later. Um, happy to be home, um, but glad to have made the, uh, the expedition. So I'd like to thank funding sources, NSF, the Blavatnik Foundation, Cary Institute, and um, for intellectual stimulation and feedback, lots of scientists at CUNY, uh, including especially my students. And this is a chrono sequence of two pictures of my, uh, of my lab at different points um, over these two big projects. I'd like to um, turn things back to town. Thank you. Greetings, everybody. Thank you, Rob. Do I stop sharing? You can stop sharing your screen. You can keep sharing your ideas if you'd like. <laughs> um, so far, I've received one question for you, which I'll pass on to you in just a moment. But everybody who's listening, looks like there are 58 people on the Google Plus page, plus who knows how many on the YouTube page. Uh, those of you who are listening, if you have any questions for Rob, email them to biodivtraining at gmail.com uh, or put them on the Google Plus page uh, as soon as you can so that so that Rob sees your question before he signs off in, in a little bit. Um, okay, Rob, so a question for you from Ariovaldo Cruz Neto from the Departamento Zoologia from UNESPE, which is in, in Sao Paulo State in Brazil. And Ariovaldo asks, is there any particular reason why mechanistic derived data, such as physiological data on tolerance and capacity, are not used in correlative models? It seems to me to be too simplistic to include only occurrence data and environmental data. The distribution is pretty much a consequence of how animals deal physiologically with their environment. 
Thus, a correlative approach that fails to include the range of physiological capacity is to some extent a static model that neglects the dynamics of the interaction between animals and their environment. Over to you, Mark. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. And I'd like to say, first of all, that I think that these are two different ways to get at similar answers. And one is that the, the benefits, uh, there are many benefits of the mechanistic niche models. Um, one of the benefits of the correlative niche models is that, well, it's the flip side of the coin of one of the disadvantages of the mechanistic model. So mechanistic models are a tremendous amount of work. Uh, and we really, realistically, probably can't do that for very many species. Correlative models, if we're able to develop them to a, a point where they're fairly uh, useful, are something that can be done for a much larger number of species. So I think that we are interested in getting at the species tolerances for abiotic variables um, in both approaches. And I think that whereas the whereas the mechanistic models, you know, definitely there are, for example, especially with herps, issues of um, um, acc acclimatization of the of the of the individuals, and their response may determine or may depend upon how you know how long they have been held at a particular temperature before you begin to change that temperature. I'm, uh, if you I presume you're working in this area and, and you're well aware of that kind of thing, so. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to, to do those right, and the even though those conditions are very highly controlled, then the question is, to what degree does that actually correspond to something in the field, in nature, and the, the species' ability to move around to different microenvironments um, can, can affect the overall areas that it inhabits uh, or doesn't. And another is, well, what about the effects of biotic interactions? How could we do niche models I mean, sorry, mechanistic niche models in conditions, you know, with and without various interactors, and how would that affect the species' uh, response? Um, so I don't think, in the end of the day, either mechanistic or correlative niche models are going to give, you know, a perfect answer. Um, but I think what the field needs to do is move towards ways to compare the output of mechanistic and correlative models for a a few species that we actually can do both. And some of that certainly has been done. Um, I think earlier work uh, by Graham and Hyman's uh, with agricultural species um, maybe was a little bit more uh, hopeful. Some recent things I saw with herps um, by, uh, I think, Araujo's group uh, was maybe not quite so hopeful. Um, but but maybe these, um, these steps will lead us to better and better models of each kind. Because I think, at the end of the day, we're trying, if we're using abiotic variables, we're trying to get the same circle of the BAM diagram. And then after that, when we actually want to look at distributions, then we look at um, biotic interactors or dispersal barriers um, that are affecting the species. So that's my overall philosophy of, of where, this, where the, the two fields, or two approaches, might fit together. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Rob. That seems to be the only question we've received. Um, everybody, if you have questions, you have about 10 seconds uh, to send them to me. Uh, otherwise, you're welcome to post the questions. I'm sure if Rob has time, he would be best to, to get you an answer. Um, I'll re remind everybody that our next seminar, the 25th of September, uh, it will be given by Sergio Estai of the Universidad Austral de Chile um, and should be quite interesting. So with that, I will say thank you very much to Rob and thank you everybody for tuning in. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Rob.